Welcome back to our podcast where we're covering the next book. Mm -hmm. And we just selected our last winner, technically, this, um, what is it called? Wheelofnames.com just selected Nick Feliciano that hearted one of our last posts Mm -hmm. for Daring Greatly. So, Nick, if you somehow figure out how to reach out to me, (laughs) we'll get you a copy of the book. (laughs) Um, or you can just take the one that's in the office. Um, well, that's the one. So congratulations. We would yeah, send out. Yeah, that is. Yeah. Did we send out one to uh, my mom? Winner yet? Not yet. Uh, so I guess we do need to Busted. Wah, wah, wah. Well, I just found out. Like, no, she just reached out to me, I think, yesterday. So. Your mom? Yeah. How long has it been? <laughs> I'm just kidding. You don't have to say that. How long has it been since you heard from your mom? Oh, no, I hear from her. Almost every day, uh, I have a group me chat. Yeah, we forgot to post our last podcast right away. It was sitting on my desktop for a while, mm-hmm. so that's on me. Yeah, but yeah. it's okay. This week, we're busy. We're doing what's our stuff. next book? This week, and you know, what? I don't have a book to show you because I forgot it in the other office. Do we have it? We do. Mm-hmm. Nice. Is it the new cover or the old? No, cover? it's the old cover. Ah, uh, they so, changed the cover what? on it's us. Probably good because I actually was going to say like. If but don't look for this book when you go, if you actually do want to get it. I blame Jason. You blame Jason? Yeah. It is always He redesigned it <laughs> after giving us a copy. Yeah. I think there was an ulterior motive that there. That explains why he was like, everybody, book. Here, take you it. You get a book. Just kidding. We changed the cover. <laughs> yeah, I'm on to you. But I'm really thankful that he did do that. Fair enough. Yes. Title is? I'm sorry I interrupted you. That's okay. Why are you thankful? I'm used to it. Battle, <laughs> battle, the beauty in battle. The beauty in battle. Well, not the, just beauty in beauty. battle. And I am thankful that I gave it to us because it was one of those things that I said, mm, yes. When they said they were writing it, I'm like, oh yeah, I'm definitely going to listen to that. The and then M-word. it went out. It came out without me even knowing because I'm not really in tuned with the social media wor- world. And then I found out that he had it, and then I was like, "Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get that book," and it just didn't happen. So finally, he's like, "Here, take this," and then I had it in my hands, and I was, and it did, and then it happened. It shouldn't have been that hard, but that's how it worked out. And then we bought it on Audible anyway, so we could listen to it. <laughs> yeah, that's how we do it better. But see, like, it, it wasn't until we had that book in our hands that we actually said, "Hey, let's look if this is on Audible." Yeah. So it did help us get there. Fair enough. Mm-hmm. And so, Beauty and Battle, the number one story, opening it up. Well, why is it called Beauty and Battle? I, okay, that was the second. Oh, I ruined your order. That was the second thing. Can we go out of order? Oh, we man. can't go out of order? Uh, okay, yeah. start with number one. Go ahead. Okay, no, we can go out of order. So, Jason <laughs> and Tori are these crazy people who do CrossFit. <laughs> and yes. I listened to their story about what they do during CrossFit. And I'm not even going to begin to get into all the push-ups and bicycles and all that. And I, my body starts to hurt <laughs> just thinking about all the stuff they do. But through this challenge that they are doing with a whole group of people and they're all on teams and Jason and Tori, this married couple are on a team and they are yelling at each other from across the gym and saying things that's like, not like, go, baby. It's more like, no. What are you doing? Yeah, what are yeah. you doing? You need to do the next thing. Go, go, go. And During WADS, right? Workout of the day. Yeah. That's what it stands for. Wow, you I got you. That was pretty yeah. good. Shout out CrossFit. <laughs> Never done a day of it in my life. Uh, and it just, you, you take it over from here. But No, and so they talked about how um, they hoped that they were on each other's team. They ended up on each other's team. Mm-hmm. And that during that time, they were very competitive. Both of them were very competitive and they were working. What they happened throughout this workout to summarize it is that they were really competitive, working really hard. In fact, sometimes arguing or going back and forth with each other, but they had a really clear goal Mm -hmm. of what they were trying to do. So whoever the leader was, whoever ran that CrossFit made it very clear. This is what the workout, the WAD, WAD workout of the day is W O D. Sorry. (laughs) Um, and it was really clear. They teamed up together, and they knew what the objective was. They knew they, how they were going to get there. They strategized. They figured out what each person's strength was, what each person's weakness was, yes. and divided up the different tasks, the different workouts accordingly, and they just went at it. Mm-hmm. And they did as many reps as they could. They moved as fast as they could. They went back and forth. It was heated during this whole workout, and they talk about how at the end of it they were just like exhausted, laying on the ground, 
and it had been very intense. Very, There was different agreements, different things going back and forth between the two of them. I think they ended up winning this one. Yeah, they did. But they talked about how that there was a battle, mm-hmm. but they were in it together. They had different opinions. They had different strengths. They had different weaknesses, but they were in it together because they both agreed on where they were going and the goal that they were headed to. Mm-hmm. And so through that was a battle of back and forth, back and forth, but they were battling together to get to a common place and not necessarily battling against each other. Yeah, that was really well put, babe. Thanks. That's good. I've heard it like four times. Jason tells it all the time. <laughs> <laughs> so going back to the first point and how they re- the yeah. open up the book is is you have an, he wants to bring awareness to you have an enemy Yeah. and it is not your spouse. And, and, and trying to see that that enemy is Satan and then this is later in the book, but I just wanted to throw it in. Like, you're aware of it, okay? You do have this enemy, and you're like, what do we do now? But we actually know Satan's strategy quite a bit because we see it throughout the Bi- the Bible. We've seen it through how he approached Jesus when he had fasted for 40 days. We see how he approached Adam and Eve. We can learn so much from that. Um, and they go into that, but like we are, I feel like we forget how... We are we are actually very armored for this stuff. Yeah. And we don't learn from the stories from the past. And we just try to go in at our own strengths. Yeah. And that's where we get that defeated. And we started ba- battling with each other instead of the enemy. Because that's exactly what the enemy wants. Yeah. He does want us to be at war with each other. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And to come full circle, you know, they talked about how after that, because I feel like I, d- I actually didn't bring that point home that they make there. They ended up talking about how they went home right. later and they just faced different obstacles or different things with the kids or whatever right. they were getting ready. And they found themselves at odds and they realized like in that moment at home, they were battling each other. Why? You know, because it wasn't clear of where they were going, what their objective was. And so the point in the title of the book is that there's beauty in battle and battling together shoulder towards to the shoulder. common towards the common enemy and not against each other, Mm -hmm. that we're not warring against each other, that Jason and Tori in that workout weren't battling against each other. They had difference of opinions and they were going to approach it differently, but they aligned themselves together because they believed in the bigger goal and the bigger vision. And here's a question for you on that, because I feel like not everybody, so we work out together, but not everybody necessarily work outs together. And I don't know that we could actually say that we have felt the same battle together and aligned ourselves together through working out maybe somewhat but we don't have competitions like that in what right. we do you know but have how does somebody align that to where they are how do they find battle together if they're not working out or doing different things like how do they make that practical yeah yeah actually that goes in what i have written down right here is while you're saying that story you're saying how they had a plan they um new strengths and weaknesses and they had a goal in mind of we're going to win this and this is what we're going to do to get there and it's having a vision for your marriage Mm. so just like how they had those individual things that they were going to work on it's like it's in it and they put it into three words you want believe and focus so you want to like and and who was i talking to we were actually just talking to sarah and paul um, at the marriage, uh, at our marriage class where they said they were at a certain point and they just like, you know, what? I just want better yeah. in our marriage. You know, if we're going to live the rest of our lives together, yeah, yeah, yeah. why don't we just have a better life together? And this is like, okay, you get to that point. You want, you want a better marriage yeah. and then believe it is going to actually happen. Believe in that and then focus on and then find out like what it is that will, t- and that will that it will take to make it happen. Yeah. Like yeah, figure yeah. that out. And that's what they were doing in that CrossFit. You know, they were, they're like, okay, what can we do to win this? Yeah. And it's like, so, you know, applying that to your marriage, it's that as an individual couple, do you, like, do you, do you both want this? Do you yeah. believe in it? And then like, what is it going to take for it to happen and focus yeah. on that? And I think, you know, I think that's what they have in the book, right? right. And I, if I could add, and I'm just going to do that because that's this is our show, not Jason's. You got to see it first, right? So one thing, you know, in WAD that they did is they said, here's the goal. Here's what the overall objective is, and here's how to, 
but they didn't necessarily say how or how you could do it. Like that was all on, on the CrossFit members, but they had to see it first. And I yeah. think so many times, I know even in our own marriage that we, what we saw is what was passed down to us and no harm in that except it limited what we saw we could have. And so being really clear on what you can have and what you see and what that goal is, is extremely important because then when you're really clear on that and the vision, like you said, and what you see for your marriage, now we can align and say like, do we agree on that? And if we do, okay, let's go to battle. How are we going to get there? Right. Mm -hmm. How do we get aligned? How do we get to there? Get past our disagreements because we believe in that. Yeah. Right. And that that ties into what he said about, you know, seeing and and visualizing. Visualizing. Thank you. Yeah. So they did a study on uh, on the brain. They did all these, these stickers all over just study what's happening in the brain while these people were visually seeing a sunset and they saw the brain just spark, you know, light up. Yeah. And then they asked another group of people who also were hooked up and said, hey, and visualize a sunset. Yeah. And the same exact thing happened. Yeah. Your brain really thought that that was happening. So when you visualize your marriage and that goal that it's going to, you know, your, your, your body like feels it, they see it, it sees it and you start working towards it because you believe in it. Yeah. Yeah. I might have messed that up, but no, that was, that was it. good. <laughs> yeah, no, don't no second guess it. Yeah, that's what the study was. Is that here's a group of people that actually saw the sunset, and here's what it was. Here's a group that they said, "Now just pretend you're seeing one and envision it," and the brain reacted the same to both ways. And it's just the power of our mind, you know. Mm-hmm. And and we could go down hundred rabbit trails here. I'm going to try not to, yeah. but your brain is extremely powerful, and whatever you envision and whatever you see your brain takes that as real, you know, Mm -hmm. because that's just what it does. So if you envision it and if you see it, that's why if you want to go to self development, like that's why writing down your goals and envisioning it is so important because your brain starts to say, Hey, this is real. This is happening in it. And it accepts that as truth now, really. Mm -hmm. And so same way as a a vision in your marriage or in any relationship that you have um, or anything in life is if you start envisioning it and, your mind starts to see that and accept that as truth and then everything else kind of follows after that. Yeah. As a piece of cake comes yeah. easy. Mm-hmm. It's easy. Uh, this next part is one of my favorite parts because this is one of the things that John is passionate about and I love it. Expectations. Yeah. All right. So unmet expectations and Jason said it, one of the, the leading conflicts in marriage dive down into that thought yeah is is that there's unmet expectations right that's the point that they were making in the book so i know i'm trying not to go down a rabbit trail here and i'm going to try and keep it short yeah because expectations are really important raise the topic um for me, and that's what I'll speak to, my experience with expectations. So mm-hmm. expectations for me, I went through a period of my life where I realized that expectations were important and that it really would mess you up if they weren't met. And so my natural reaction and some things that I was listening to during that time and information I was consuming was that you shouldn't have expectations going into anything. That if you didn't have expectations going into something, then you couldn't be let down. You can have your hopes too high or too low. It just... It was what it was. You didn't expect anything. And so I tried that for a while, right? And then I realized that that just wasn't reality because Mm. even in that, if I was going into something saying I'm going to have no expectations, well, there was an expectation in that, right? (laughs) That I wasn't going to have expectations. Anyway, and so it's this real, I feel like this is like an Alice in Wonderland thing here. Um, But there was this real like confusing thing in my head and it just didn't make sense. I didn't know how to do that. I don't think anybody can truthfully and this is just me i don't think anybody can really truthfully go into something with no expectations i don't think that's possible i think expectations exist and i don't think they're right or wrong i just think it's it happens you have expectations or different beliefs that you think is going to happen and it just is what it is it's based on who you are based on past events it's just that's natural and so what i learned was and through a lot of different coaching and different things that i read was that expectations aren't right or wrong they just exist where it really causes trouble 
is when you don't talk about the expectations. Because if I don't talk about, hey, Joe, this is what I expect on date night tonight. I expect to, maybe I expect to not talk about this or I just really can't make, sometimes I do that. Sometimes I come home and say, look, I really don't want to make any decisions. Like you literally, Mm -hmm. you could put anything in front of me. I'll eat anything at this point. Like it literally, I don't want to make a decision. Don't ask me to make a decision. And that's my expectation. The problem is, is when I don't say that to you, when I come home and you ask me something as a loving wife, trying to give me what I want. And my reaction is like, God, I, I'm, I don't want to answer one more question, you know? Mm-hmm. And I have this inside. Well, she didn't know that. And my expectation is like, I just wanted to come home and not make any more decisions because I made a million today. And your expectation is, I just want to give my husband what he wants, mm-hmm. you know, because I haven't seen him all day. I just want to be there and be his help me, right? And so the point isn't that one is right or one that's wrong. The problem exists when we don't talk about the fact that they yeah. exist. Mm-hmm. And so what I have learned and am learning is to talk about that expectations exist and this is my expectation going into it and it doesn't have to be that weird hey sweetheart i have this expectation of date night tonight that you know it's, it's gonna be good tell me you your know and then it's the so it doesn't have to be that crazy right it could just be hey i'm just letting you know like i need a quiet ride and it's truthful like probably yeah. tonight i need a quiet ride to the restaurant because I have not had a chance to slow down my brain yet. It's yeah. just been a nonstop day. Probably. And it, I haven't. It's like that every day now. It's true. You're like, Fair well, enough. Maybe today. At least this time. <laughs> but I'm voicing it. Okay. Yes. And so it's probably going to be a quiet ride to the restaurant. And Joe has traditionally been with kids all day, two little kids that are crazy. She's like, <laughs> I need real human interaction, not a little kid interaction. And so if I don't voice that or she doesn't voice her expectation, all of a sudden there's tension and then we'll mm-hmm. go into date night, which is mm-hmm. supposed to be a really meaningful time with this letdown. And it's just this yeah. seesaw of things that we've experienced. And so what I'm learning is that we just got to talk about them. And then from those expectations form an agreement, right? Mm-hmm. It's not right for me to go in and say, Hey, we're not talking on the way to the rest. That's not fair. You didn't have a chance to voice and agree to it. Right. Yeah. But it's just, it's a chance for me to say, Hey, I know you wanted to talk you know, cause you've been with kids all day, whatever it is. But I really, if I'm going to really be present and really be able to listen, I've got to have a few minutes of just like quiet time on yeah. the way to the restaurant and then giving you the opportunity to just say whatever it is that's on your yeah. mind. Yeah. Cause it, I, I might've had a really bad day right. and, and open up and say like, babe, I, I, I get that, but I want you to know, like I'm really struggling right yeah. now. You know, just, I'm yeah. just trying to throw a stick into you. No, the, that's perfect though. Be, and, and then it's my opportunity at that yeah. point to say, Okay, you know what? For me right now, I can throw mine out. You're right. Let me be present for these. I'll give you this five, ten minutes, and then maybe I have yeah. some quiet time mm-hmm. because this is more important here. Yeah. But we never would have had that conversation. You would have went into it like, I can't wait to get with John because I really got to digest all this information that's just killing my brain. And I'm like, mm-hmm. I can't wait to have a few minutes quiet time. And then we have, <laughs> and, and that's just reality. That's yeah. life. Mm-hmm. That's marriage. That's relationship. But the problem doesn't exist in that there's an expectation. It exists that when we don't talk about it and give the other person an opportunity to say, okay, yeah, I can agree to do that. Let's mm-hmm. do that, you know? Yeah. And then we come to an agreement. And now when we're in agreement, like the Bible says, how can two, unless they're in agreement, move forward together, right? Now when we're in agreement, now we can move forward. Oh, I love that. That was my yeah, and that's all 10 second expectation. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. And that was all from John and Joe. That was, you know. Yeah. Didn't necessarily, the point I think in the book that they're making is that expectation, unmet expectations, right, cause a problem. Yeah. And it's a big problem in marriages. And one of the major reasons is mm-hmm. that there's conflict in marriage, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right. And then um, I'll talk a little bit about Tori. We've been talking about Jason way too much. So, for sure. Tori is a sweetie. And we, we have had the opportunity to meet this couple. Yeah. Um, and um, I would say I'm not exactly like Tori. We're like, I mean, everybody is different, yeah. but we definitely have less similarities in, in each other um, than most people. Like she says in the book, how she loves the, the movie in the notebook. Yeah. And then and you're like, you hate that movie. I really don't like it. <laughs> That's amazing. I really don't. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And then I don't, I would say hate. That sounds like a hard dislike. Word, let's just like, I, yeah. And then like later on in the book or whatever, he talks about gladiator and I'm like, yes best movie ever yes. are you not ent- okay yeah. i'll stop <laughs> so no don't finish it no. <laughs> but it's just um but 
even though we were so different, really, she still was really relatable. Mm. And I think, and I was th- and I was trying to figure out like why. Yeah, why why was it? Yeah, because we're very different. She just pours out her heart, and she's mm. being very authentic, and I can hear it as she's reading. And um, I think that's why it was relatable. Because and there was one part that was like we, were, I was just like yes, and I I want I want to read it because it was so Do good. It. And I wanted to share it with you. I haven't shared this with you yet. Oh, man. Yeah. Mm. Pressure's on. It's actually, we've talked about it, but like the way that her wording was just perfect. So it says, early in our marriage, if I couldn't, if I, hmm. oh, if I could make Jason happy, I was happy. But the moment I sensed I was unable, oh, man, my writing. Okay, so basically, this is what it means. You know, so, um, but the moment I sense that I wasn't able to do that, that it, I had this feeling of hopelessness that would invade my spirit. Okay, and then when I, when I, went, I butchered that, sorry, Tori. But that feeling of hopelessness that she felt. And this is exactly what I struggled with, John, because I wanted you to be happy, and I still do. I want you to be happy. And I totally put that on my shoulders and uh, and vice versa i definitely uh, put that on you for you to make me happy and then that second that i see that you are not happy and it it, 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 most of the time truly it's not me and i know this because you tell me (laughs) um it's that that hopeless i feel hopeless in those moments and so when she in, in my spirit so when she put that i was like oh my word that's it that's the feeling i was feeling just and it's and it's because I was carrying that weight of I was supposed to be your source of happiness. Yeah. And guess what? We're not supposed to look for happiness in our spouse. Yeah. That's a really big point. <laughs> yeah. Because I think a lot of, maybe not a lot, I don't know, right? But I think there's a decent amount of people that go into marriage thinking that their spouse makes them happy. Yeah, that's what we We've do. heard people <laughs> say that recently that my spouse makes me happy and it's I mean I think I understand the heart there and I get it but my spouse wasn't made to make me happy you know and anyway yeah without going down the rabbit trail but that's a problem if you're looking to your spouse for true happiness you know number one like you can't make your spouse do anything right Mm -hmm. I mean it's all their own actions it's all their own choices in every single moment and so to think that I could make her happy when happiness is a choice that she has to make of where to find that, well, that's not right for me or for you to put that on each other. But we go into marriage thinking that that's the case, right? Yeah, very true. All right, we have about three more points that are lengthy. How much time do Hit we em. have? Just go. All of them? Okay. The, oh, this is good, and you're going to do most of the talking. I'll chime in. But the story of uh, Satan being sent to Earth. Oh, man. It's so good. I you mean, you said we have to go quick, and it. then we talk about this. Yeah, right. I told you. We've okay. never heard this story before said in this way. Yeah. So, so, so good. Um, man, there's a lot here. Okay. <laughs> um, okay. I don't necessarily know that all this was in the book. I'm just going to clarify. Some of this may have come from conversations with Jason. And the retreat that we were at. But anyway, um, as a Christian, I'm going to ask, and I'm going to pause for like two seconds. Pause for effect. What was the first sin of man? Uh, what was the first sin, right? Yeah. That we know about. What was the first sin? Most of us would probably say it was Adam or Eve. Right. Mm-hmm. And and there's going to be a lot of conversation about that. And I'm going to skip that for this time being. However, one of the things that we learned that Jason explained, and I, and I think they talked about it some in the book, is that the first sin actually was Lucifer when he was in heaven, wanting to be as God and on his level. So it was pride at the end of the day. And what's really interesting, I'm just going to take the time on it. If it's a long podcast, I'm sorry, but I'm not sorry because this is really important and it was really important for me because I'd never heard it before. So what happened in that moment, God, who had the ability to say, you're done, gone, right? right? That's a sin. You can't be like me. Mm -hmm. uh, Didn't do that. He said, "Um, 
okay, I understand Lucifer. So Lucifer, here's what I want you to do. You're going to go round up your angels. And Michael, my archangel, you're going to go round up your angels. And then there's going to be a war. And there was a war. And Michael had two thirds and Lucifer had one thirds. And Lucifer was hence kicked. And those angels were kicked out of heaven and were sent somewhere. Where were they sent? They were sent to earth. Right. Right. So then I don't know the time frame. I don't know how much longer, but God says, hey, I'm going to create man in my image, right? Yeah. And so he says, I'm going to create man in my image. And where is he going to put him? I'm going to put him on earth. Well, wait a minute. That's exactly where he put Lucifer, yeah. the fallen angel, who tried to overthrow him. He put him on earth. So why would he put Adam on earth? And so he puts him on earth, puts him in charge of naming all the animals, blah, blah, blah. And then finds out, hmm, it's not good for man to be alone. Yeah. What's interesting, so then pulls out the rib, makes Eve, right? Now there's this um, trinity example between God the Father, Adam, Eve. And there's like this perfect trinity, very symbolic and a whole lot there, but not going extremely deep. Now, all of a sudden... When Eve is in the picture, guess who enters for the very first time from what we can see according to scripture, mm -hmm. who was there the whole time, time, who Adam probably named because it was an, it was a, it was an animal on earth. Yeah. So it was Adam's responsibility to name this serpent that we'd never heard about up until now. Now, when Eve is created, the serpent says, Ooh, wait a minute. Adam is looking at her different. Mm -hmm. Something just happened. Yeah. Something's different because now there's this perfect trinity. And now, and I'm going to come full circle with this. There's a lot here. Stay with me. <laughs> and now the serpent says, I'm going to go attack Eve. Right. And then you have the fall. Okay. Which is what most of us would have, and me included, would have said was the first sin, but it wasn't. And here's the significance in it is that Satan realized how to get to Adam. And so the question, the larger question here is why would God who knows everything put Adam here on earth where that serpent was, where Lucifer was? Mm -hmm. And I can't say that this is in scripture, but this is the best unbelievable explanation that I've ever heard of it. Right. Is that it wouldn't have been very surprising or very difficult for God to say, Satan, Lucifer, you're in hell. You're defeated. There would have been no story there, really, because he's a God. But what would have been really powerful is if there was somebody made in God's image mm -hmm. that had full access to his power, but wasn't a God, but had full access to God, that he had the power to defeat Lucifer. And now all of a sudden, you have an unbelievable story. Mm -hmm. Because now, and, and the illustration, right, that I heard, you know, that Jason gave to his credit, right, is that, you know, for me to, to get in a fight with somebody or whatever that's another male, like that's a 50-50, whatever, it's not going to be a big deal, right, who wins. Or, but if... Grace, my five and a half year old, gets in a fight with a grown man and then were to, but she had full access to everything that I knew. And I was able to coach her and explain how she could win and how she could conquer because she had full access to every ability that I had that was out there. And all of a sudden, she conquered this grown man. And now everybody's like, how in the world? Well, it couldn't be because of Grace. It had to be where she got the information from, right? And holy cow, how much more important is that? Mm -hmm. And so now, I know I'm really shortening this, but I'm trying to be quick. So now you have man who was made in God's image that could tap into the power, the full power of God that we have the ability to conquer Satan, especially with that trinity now with the man and the wife. So now when a husband and wife are together in unity, in oneness with the father, it's no competition for us to beat Satan and put him down and conquer him under our heel because that is why we're here. 
But that isn't what happened. That isn't what happened. What happened is Satan caused a divide there. And when Satan caused a divide there, now all of a sudden he was prince of this world. Mm -hmm. Because we, or Adam and Eve, gave him that space and created that there. And then he became prince of this world. And now he had power and dominion because they gave him that space up here. But it wasn't supposed to be that way. It's supposed to be Adam, Eve, God, perfect trinity. There was no shame. There was complete nakedness. There was complete mm -hmm. vulnerability. The serpent was nothing. It was a serpent until it caused that division between the man and the wife. Why is a husband and wife, why is marriage always attacked? Why is divorce rate so high? Because that mm -hmm. is how the prince of this world gets beat. That is how it gets conquered. Mm -hmm. That was my short explanation of it. <laughs> man, babe, I love that. I love the how you said it. I get emotional while you're talking about him. It's so good. Two more, okay. All right. So narrow pathways. Yeah. They 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 get into this, and this is really cool because this is all backed up by science, and yep. science is catching up with the Bible. It's yep. a phrase that you'll hear a lot nowadays, and um and it, a lot of it was renewing your mind, and yeah. um that like that she envisioned. I think like a I think it was a bike path, and there was this, this a neighbor had done this walked it made a trail just kept going walking it walking it riding his bike or whatever and then now there's this path well it's kind of like th that in your brain you have it you think something a certain way and then the next time that situation happens your brain just kind of already makes up that yeah. reaction you know it just keeps going it creates that path and then you talk about renewing your m mind renewing your mind which yeah. is something we've heard around about a ton growing up sure but it wasn't until recently that i really understood what that actually is yeah and they get into a three-step process and what that three-step is is recognizing renown uh yeah renown no yeah, renounce. Yep. Yeah, renounce it and then replace it. So yep. recognizing, okay, what are we recognizing? We're recognizing that there is a lie. Yep. You know, we're recognizing that there's a fear right. or anything. And then we're renouncing that lie. Yep. And saying that that's not, that's not it. That's not. Right. And renounce it. And then the replace it with truth. Yep. Right. Yeah, it's beautiful. We we hit on this a little bit, even with four agreements, yeah. different language, same exact concept, right? Is that anytime you're in a loop, anytime you're in something like that, you've got to first have awareness or recognize that there's something there that's not true. Yes. That you're believing a lie. You're in the victim mindset or you're whatever. Like you have to have that awareness. Could be created by somebody else. Could be yourself. Could be the Holy Spirit that brings it. But there has to be a recognition. If you don't recognize that as an individual, you're never going to go past it in that loop. Mm -hmm. You're never going to cure it. You've got to first be aware of it and recognize that. Yeah. But then when you just recognize it, there's actually, I think that's when you don't get the growth. Yeah. Because you have to. Well, it's replace, only the first step. Yeah. It's yeah. only the first step, right? Because yeah. um, when you renounce it and then you replace it with truth. Yeah. That's, and then you have to renounce it, right? So yeah. you have to come out of agreement with it. Right. Because for so long, okay, don't go down a rabbit trail. For so long, your mind has said, this is truth. We're going to mm -hmm. accept this as truth. And so now it's a habit. Mm -hmm. And so you have to say, okay, this isn't truth. You have to reject that. And sometimes verbally, actually probably every time, actual out loud, True. you have to say, hey, this isn't truth. Mm -hmm. I don't believe this anymore, right? But even that isn't enough because if you just do that and you don't replace it with something, then you're just going to still be stuck in that loop because you're not replacing it with anything. You have nothing else to sink your teeth into for that neuroplasticity to kick in. Yeah. And this is not just a, okay, I went through the circle one time yeah. on this certain situation and then, oh, hey, yeah. all my neural pathways are... And remember how long you've done it. Yes. You've created this highway in your brain for 10, 15, 20, 30, 40, 50 years. Mm -hmm. You're not just going to all of a sudden be aware of it and then change it overnight, you right. know? Let's be realistic about it, you know? It's going to be a consistent renewing of your mind over and over to replace that. But it's possible. Possible. Yeah. And it's real and, and it's scientific. Yeah, science is finally figuring yep. that out, that we have that um, plasticity in our brain that yep. we can do that. We're li literally not that long ago. It's like you can't teach an old dog new tricks. Yep. I know that's a harsh word thing to say. I like it. Yeah, but like it's true. They really thought that though. That's just it's it's amazing. Huh? Yep. And then uh, the last point is oh, hit yeah. it. Forgiveness. Yeah. Mm. That's a big one. Okay. 
when I talk about it, I skip a lot of things because I get passionate and I miss and I my words don't flow out. But I'm gonna try to do it, and then you can talk do after it. me and fix Go. what I mix mess up. All right. Have you ever been in a situation where someone has done something wrong to you in any way? A uh, business deal where you got cheated, um, or even stuff at home, a spouse just really does you wrong or anything and you feel that hurt and then you're like oh, well I need to forgive them because I don't want to have that bitterness grow inside me and you know what I'm just gonna I'm gonna forgive them okay I'm Lord I please I just want to just want to forgive them I'm, I'm doing that now I'm just gonna forgive them and then they come back around that person you see them they come to your mind and you're like oh it's like they cut you deep again like, I've done that. I don't know about anybody else. And it's like, but I thought I forgave them. Mm -hmm. Like, what happened? I felt this way for a very long time. Yeah. And then going through this book and talking to Jason, I it helped me figure out what the, what was happening. So the question that he asked is, what was you say the question because you'll probably word it better than me, than me. Oh man, you just put me on the spot. I don't remember the question. The uh, like, do you believe that Christ? forgives someone who doesn't ask for forgiveness yeah right okay think about that do you believe that do you or do you like hmm does that make you is that thought provoking for you because it was for me yes me too yeah and i came to the conclusion and could base off of scripture too like i don't think that i don't think that and help me out here with this one yeah no he doesn't period I mean, he, if you don't have the repentance in your heart um, where you can go and you ask for forgiveness, it has to be asked for. If yeah. you don't go, it's like salvation um, for a lot of us that know that language, right? If you don't go and have, and show repentance and ask for that forgiveness, then there is no recognition that you did something wrong. And especially with the Father, if there is no recognition that you're lost and that you did something wrong, that you screwed up, you made a bad decision, whatever it is, then he will not give you forgiveness because forgiveness can't be given if it's not asked for and requested and recognized. And so the point here is that, and I've been in this situation too, where yes, I forgive somebody, but they never asked for it and they never recognized that what they did hurt me mm -hmm. and caused me a lot of harm. And they never ask for forgiveness. But in my heart, I'm saying, I forgive them. Our Heavenly Father doesn't even do that. Right. So there's no question to why there's a conflict inside of you and why you're still like struggling to try and get over that. Yeah. Well, because you're not supposed to forgive that instance because they didn't ask for it. Yeah. And you can't give it if they didn't ask for it and they didn't show repentance and they didn't recognize that there was something wrong and ask for your forgiveness. You can't grant forgiveness because even our Heavenly Father right. doesn't grant forgiveness. And now you're like, okay, so you just don't forgive them? Right. Like, but no, like, that's when you give that to God. Yeah. You know, we're not meant to carry that. That's what Christ was died on the cross for. So when we try to hold on to that heaviness of bearing what they did and I forgive them on my own strength, it's, you know, that so when we give it to them and then we pray for that individual. Right. And then you pray that they actually search out God and ask for God's forgiveness. Am I saying that right? Yeah. You know, it's, it's been a minute, so, but no, you have to take it to the one. So what has to happen is there has to be, there is no justification that happens if you're granting forgiveness in that, because it was never justified. There was never a reconciliation. There was never a repentance in that moment. And so you can't grant forgiveness. And so the only one that could is somebody who, paid for all of that harm and that damage already. Right. And even that, as our Heavenly Father says in the Scripture, He doesn't do that until that is recognized or until Judgment Day for some people, until it's finally like, oh my word, I was lost yeah. and there, this was a problem. And then He will he will always grant forgiveness, right? but He won't do it for somebody who doesn't ask for mm -hmm. forgiveness. And so it's, it's the vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. If you want something righted and justified and somebody hasn't asked for forgiveness, it is not on you to give them forgiveness. They haven't asked for it. It is on you to turn it over 
and get rid of it and put it out of your hands and say, look, Lord, I don't want to hold anything against this individual. There's work that needs to be done. You clearly have to do work in this person's heart. When he comes to me, I will grant forgiveness and I am not going to hold it against him. But until he comes to me, I can't grant that forgiveness, but I can give it over to you and say, I don't want this. This is too much for me. I'm not going to pick this up. It's yours. You deal with it. It's your responsibility at this point. You take this hurt, this harm, this weight, and now it's yours. And it's off of me at this point. If he comes to me, I'll grant it. But until you work in his life or their life and and they come to me and ask for it, I'm not going to grant it. Yeah. And that also reminds me too, like when I'm with Grace and I do something that I'm not supposed to, like yelling is a big thing for me that I'm working on and ha- being angry. And I think, you know, I my first thing that I've been working on is to ask for her to forgive me. Yeah. And then um, I found myself getting out of the habit of also after that, both of us praying together yeah. and and me asking for God to forgive me yeah, for, it's beautiful. for reacting in right. that anger. So even there, that's with your children, yeah. you know, uh, it's good. And I will highlight real quick, and I think this is the last thing, unless you have anything else, I will highlight that there is a certain responsibility that we have as individuals to say, if somebody doesn't know that they wronged you mm-hmm. and you're just playing the victim and pretending that everything's okay, saying, oh, God's going to take care of it. Like, there's a certain level of responsibility that you have to say, hey, just to let you know, like, this was wrong, this hurt me, deal with it however you want, hand it over to the Father. But if you don't bring awareness to it, somebody could go through their whole life and not have a clue yeah. that they harmed you. Like, there is a certain level of responsibility where, we are responsible for letting somebody know, hey, that sucked. I don't know why you did it to me. That's okay. I- I'm going to hand it over. I've let it go. I've given it to the Father. But I'm just letting you know, like, that that really hurt me mm-hmm. bad. And then let it go from there. But if you don't bring that, there's still going to be conflict in you. And you just say, it's not as easy as just being like, you know, this person offended me. Okay, God, you know, they offended me. It's all okay. And then you're just playing this victim mindset. Like, no, there's a certain level of responsibility that we have to go to that individual and say, hey, I'm just yeah. going to let you know, like, that was wrong. I understand, like, I don't know why he did it. That's okay. I'm going to turn it over to the Father, but I'm just letting you know, like, that really hurt me. I didn't see it that way. This offended me. Whatever it is, like, you have that level of responsibility as well, too. There's work for you to do. Yeah. Don't cop out of it. Right. Beauty and Battle. That was good. Great book. It's a very easy read. Mm -hmm. They illustrated it very well. They gave a lot of illustrations and practical examples as well. And so it's very good on aligning looking at what what is your big goal thought provoking there and then also some practical things about when you do believe a lie or when things like that come how to be equipped to handle that and they have a podcast now that's out yeah um along the same lines of the book and they have a new cover on their book so it's just beautiful and um i'm excited to see their ministry the jason and tori oh, yeah. that's what it's called going somewhere. yeah mm-hmm. the very good couple very in step with each other and uh, you know we got to spend some time with them and i feel grateful that we did so yeah. A uh, very good book. We're going to give it away again to anybody that likes or comments or hearts or does anything. Any engagement we get on this post will put you in the, what was it, namepicker.com uh, wheel or wheel picker. I don't know. Anyway, <laughs> I want to stop trying to guess what it was and uh, we'll give this book away. But if you're married or not married um, or looking to get married, this is a very good book. And it, there's equipping in there. There's practical examples. And um it's a very real and authentic couple, and that's yes. something that we've really grown to appreciate. Mm-hmm. So shout out to Jason and Tori. Love you guys. You guys have meant a lot to us. Yes. And uh, get their book. Support them. It's a great ministry. And um, they're excited about helping couples yeah. align themselves together. Mm. Thanks for listening. <laughs>